This is DJ. This is Ish. And this is Pero, Pero Let, Let Me, Me Tell, Tell You. you. Dale. Man, that was a good time when Jennifer Love Hewitt ruled the ruled the world, <laughs> ruled the world, sort of speak. Oh, good times, good, good times. times, good times. What are you waiting for? <laughs> what are you waiting for? <laughs> <laughs> All right, are we recording? Here we are. Well, then, welcome to episode forty-three, everybody. <laughs> hey, hello, everybody. It's always a good thing to start a conversation with Jennifer Love Hewitt. Well, I mean, she's bubbly. I mean, she was pretty hot. What was the movie that she did that she looked really hot in? That she was wearing like All a blue. No, but she was Can't wearing like a blue wait. crop top. Can't hardly wait. Can't hardly wait. Yeah, Can't she was at the party. Breakers? Yeah, her and her Sigourney Weaver. It's Sigourney like Weaver was so hot. Who knew that Sigourney Weaver was like? Well, when she's not being chased by aliens. Although she did that movie Galaxy Quest. She remember? Really and I remember thinking like. She's sexy. Yeah, like she looks good in a <laughs> space bodysuit. Sigourney Weaver. Who knew? Yeah, and that space bodysuit doesn't hide anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, bueno, Thanksgiving is gone. Now yes. the holidays are officially among us. I feel like such a fat ass. I know. I haven't been to the gym. I mean, well, I went to the gym earlier this week, but everything I'm not is consistent. tighter. <laughs> I know. I could not do cosplay right now. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a fun. Everything's the world. tighter. Not not. This is the time I start wearing layers. Not because it's cold, <laughs> but because I look terrible in a t-shirt. So I'll discreetly wear, a sh- you know, like a long sleeve shirt over it. And like, a, a, a tener capas. Yeah, and it's like I'm gonna, I'm mixing it up. I'm mixing it up. You start to dress like Raven, and that's so Raven. <laughs> That girl wore more layers than a blue onion. But we love Raven. We do love Raven. We love Raven. We do. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, now holiday season is in full swing. Uh, comer pastera, comer lechón. Arroz con andule. <laughs> bueno, not yet. Not yet. Well, that, that's coming, in our, cri- that's coming that. in our Christmas episode. That's true. That's true. Yes, we're going to have a, for, for our listeners, we're going to have a special themed Christmas yes. episode. So preparense. Should, should we drink like coquito the way that we drank rum? In our 21st? Sure. We should do Coquito to honor Puerto Rico. That's true. You know, That's our true. Um, true. our sister nation, if you will. Well, like, sort of. Different, different feather of the same bird? Yeah, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> do you like Coquito? Uh, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's not eggnog. No, I, I, I love eggnog too. I don't like eggnog. I don't like eggnog. I, I never bought it at La Vaquita. Mm-hmm. That's the best one. Yeah. Do they still have it? Well, do they still have vaquitas? They do still have vaquitas. Shit, where's her lot? I drove one, one by one the other day. I'm like, Baquita! I'm like, oh my God, it's an open Baquita. Because you know the Baquita on Kendall Drive and, um, I'm sorry, on Sunset and 107? It's a Smoothie King. It's though, a isn't? Smoothie King. Yeah. I'm like, you suck the fun out of that Baquita. Literally, because they use straws. Yeah. Especially, I don't know about you, but to our listeners out there, to me, Smoothie King... All the smoothies taste alike. You could have like the guava and mango, and it tastes the same as like peanut butter chocolate. Uh, maybe not peanut butter, <laughs> but all like the fruity ones. They all taste alike. They just I, taste like fruit. They just taste like a fruit combination. The way so. that dessert at IKEA just tastes like nothing. Dessert. It tastes like the idea of dessert. Yeah, nothing. Yeah. So la vaquita, the, the vaquita. My favorite thing from la vaquita is the ice cream. I do love the vaquita ice cream. It is like the yeah. best. For those of you who are not from South Florida, it's farm stores. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it had a gigantic cow, so obviously all the Hispanics. <laughs> call, call it vaquita, la vaquita. La vaquita. The cow. The cow. Yeah. The little cow. The little cow. The little cow. Yes, yes. And it's like a, yeah, it's like a drive through Damn it. You know, they missed a great opportunity with the heifer. Yeah. The heifer foundation. So it was like a drive through kind of convenience store. But yeah. they had their own line of products, and mm-hmm. they were just fantastic. So and good. there's still a few around. Um... But not as many as at one yeah, point there were. Point. It's kind of like in Sears territory. It's still here, but it's yeah dwindling. Yeah. yeah. So, There's that. bueno, <laughs> let's get into our regularly scheduled program. Yes, before we jump into our interview with the, one of the founders of the Cuba One Foundation and one of the alumni of the foundation. Yes, yes. Um, and that's going to be a great, great talk. But actually, that, that interview is going to tie very well in what I want to talk about, which is obviously the caravan. And what's going on at the border right now. Um, as our listeners probably know, this week and in the last couple of weeks, well, for a while now, the caravan has been 
creeping up. I'm not going to pretend to know to, to know that it had gotten here until you told me the other day. Really? I thought it was still on its way because I felt like esa caravana coja was like on its way. <laughs> no, for us, like, no, six it, it reached the border already. No, I know, but I felt like yeah, because the thing. Well, let, let's give a little bit of context. So the caravan has been, you know. Coming up, if you will, right. moving on up for some time now, a couple of months even, and they finally uh, reached the border yeah. in Tijuana in particular. And a few days ago, or about a week ago, um, there was a lot of tension when um, a lot of the people <clears throat> in the caravan they started defying uh, Mexican police because they were in Tijuana, and they started running to the but border. I feel like everyone defies the police in Tijuana. Well. Your right. American tourist who goes exactly that's what I'm saying. It's it, um, it's part of the course for the and poor cops. Um, they rush to the actual border, like the fence, and many of them were um, trying to climb the fence and. Stupid ass question. Is that fence like does it have barbed wire? Is it electrified? Does uh, it have a part of, of it does, but it, you have to see it. It's hard to explain. It's a very difficult fence to climb because okay. it's like standalone columns. And they're triangular, triangular kind of sort of. So they're very hard to to um, to climb. It's like American Ninja Warrior. But nonetheless, um, it was penetrated, and um, the U.S. responded because the U.S. did have personnel on site mm -hmm. with tear gas. Right. So then uh, there's been some iconic photos already that have mm -hmm. like surfaced of right. like a mother kind of running from the chaos and the tear right. gas. And I think one of her kids, like she has a child a in her shoe. hand, when and he's kind of like airborne right? almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and there's chaos there, and, um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, reports. I, I got a lot of my news, believe it or not, from Sky News, which is a British... It's funny, Jose gets most of his from BBC. Yeah, I, I, I either BBC or Sky News. Yeah. Um, honestly, I get Sky... I'm more into Sky News now because they have an app on my Fox Fire TV. <laughs> La convenience, yeah. But I've always liked, for some reason, I've always liked getting news um, uh -huh. from the UK, especially news pertaining to the United States. Because it's, makes, a little, it's a little removed. Yes, exactly. Right, right. It, it, it kind of doesn't make sense, right? That I like to get American news from a British source. Because you're getting it reported as news, not as this is the angle of our cable. Network. Right, or our propaganda. Right, right. So, you know, they've had a lot of coverage on it, and they've covered, well, not only them, all net networks have, mm -hmm. you know, covered how... A lot of thousands of these people are in um, in camps, and there's so many children. And now, because there's so many people, and there's cleanliness issues, there's like right. people getting sick, and everything that comes with that. So, I guess the question to you, in terms of the topic of conversation, and to our listeners out there, is: What are your thoughts on this caravan or the people? reaching the border well, do think, you think that they should just be denied entry do you think they should be granted granted the chance to seek asylum and be processed legally um do you think it's a threat to the united states well i think we've made i mean we've talked about this before we talked about this when the caravan was still you know the venga bus <laughs> um <laughs> and we're <laughs> oh, i feel so bad that you're making me laugh over something that's not funny <laughs> You know, we, we had this conversation, so I think my... New York to San Francisco. My, that is not an inner city disco. Um, my thoughts are fairly clear. You know, I don't agree with anybody just basically saying, aquí estoy yo y voy a hacer lo que me da la gana, pepe cojones. You know, mm -hmm. I, I have an issue with that. Mm -hmm. Do I understand that these, you know, that it's, it's a, I mean, it's a lot of people. So there's probably, you know, it's like the facts of life. You take the good, you take the bad, right? Like mm -hmm. it's all muddled together. There's children. There's, it's a whole lot of factors. I get that. Um, do I think they should be granted the opportunity to come to the country? Sure. Um, I think they should follow the process, whatever that process is. Is or mm -hmm. is not, and I say that as somebody who genuinely has no clue what the process okay. is because I'm a U.S. citizen, and not only a U.S. citizen, but both of us are U.S. citizens and are children of Cuban immigrants who mm -hmm. didn't go through that process. Didn't go through that process for various reasons. My father came in the Peter Pan flights. You know, my mother came. You know, so there, there's just a whole different scenario there at, at play. It's a weird situation because on the one hand, you know, you can look at the pictures and they are horrible and they are. Affecting and you know at the end of the day specifically when you're talking about children children no tienen you know no tienen la culpa mm -hmm. you know están pagando los platos rotos for for something that they had no choice in the matter right but with that said as a parent you are putting your children in a situation that you knew coming here I mean you knew showing up wasn't just going to be like going to the gates of Disneyland mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying so I feel horrible for the children but by the same token you know I I refuse to sit back and say 
the you know and allow the parents to play the role of victim a hundred percent as mm-hmm. if they didn't know what was going to happen or okay. what could potentially happen. Um, you know, and and it's it's a horrible two sides of every coin type situation because then if you don't do something at the border and you just allow people to just barge through mm-hmm. the first time they barge through the second time another right. group or third you know what I mean it sets a weird precedent so it's I don't pretend to have all the answers I just don't think it's a case where you can allow you can kind of just step aside and say come right in because then where does it stop okay okay well I I think this is a very multifaceted issue mm-hmm. and obviously I disagree with everything that Trump and his administration. I just agree about with ninety nine point nine percent of everything that he does and says. Even those you know. fantastic handmade tail Christmas trees. <laughs> um, so maybe there is a point oh 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 one right, that right. I, you know he pardoned the turkey. I give him that. That's so true. That's, that's true. my point oh oh one. You know what he has turned this into and what it is are two different things. Um, that's fair. Caravans have been coming to the U.S. border for years. Hmm. I am not. Um, an advocate for open borders because if you have open borders then what do you right, have? like I said where does it stop right yeah. I'm not a fan for open borders to anyone including our very own Cubans because one of the people that used to bitch and complain about the Cuban Adjustment Act was me and so the Cubans listening to this were probably saying que comunista you know that's <laughs> true he that's, makes me use un, un libro every time that I want to get sugar from him <laughs> It's because true. you know what I, I i think that everybody if, if we're a country of laws then everybody has to have the law applied to right. them and the cuban adjustment act is a law um and cuba at one point had special circumstances that's all true and cuba is was and is a dictatorship that is true but people living in south america and in central america have even worse living conditions than cuba a lot of these people that are coming from honduras and all these places i mean these people are getting murdered by gangs right you know right. Yeah, that, we've that, talked about that is a hundred yeah. times worse then you know then the, what's going on what again, has all, always gone on in cuba again it's all circumstantial because everybody's everybody's circumstances and, and, yeah i don't like them. to compare one right. tragedy with another right but but at the very minimum they're they're going through hell and back right. the same way that other people have i i think that they should be allowed to seek asylum right. now if in the process the they they find that they do not qualify for asylum, then unfortunately, yeah, too bad, so sad. That's the process. You need to go back right. because that is the law. Now, Jeff Sessions, when he was still Attorney General, although I disagreed with his mm-hmm. um, scope of it, he did reduce the scope of asylum because mm-hmm. now I believe I, I I forget the exact words that he used, but he did not find escaping from like gang violence or such mm-hmm. fell under the spectrum of mm-hmm. asylum. So he made that scope smaller Mm -hmm. while i completely disagree with his assessment of that Mm -hmm. that is however the legal way of doing it again though i disagree with him wholeheartedly i mean i think that if you're being chased by mi-13 which is one of the most notorious gangs out there and your family's being murdered by these gangs i think that you should be granted asylum but the point that i'm making is that the attorney general limiting that scope as much as i disagree with it Mm -hmm. is legally the protocol of doing it so you have to let that process take place right the way it was designed to work Este tipo, freaking Trump, metiendo la cuchareta, as he always does, tweeting stuff that he knows nothing about, okay, and shouldn't be tweeting about, you know, calling the Ninth Judicial Circuit, you know, who uh, made a ruling on mm-hmm. these asylums, you know, saying that that was an Obama judge and sticking his mouth, his nose in the judicial branch of the government, which he should not be making comments on. I mean, for God's sake, Justice Roberts... Okay, in the Supreme Court, had to respond to Trump. When has a justice ever had to respond to the comments of a president? And do you want to know something about Justice Thomas, uh, 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 Justice Roberts? Justice Roberts was put there by Bush. He's a conservative judge, right? He's right. a quote unquote conservative right, right, right. judge. Although I, side note, as somebody who studied law and loves the Supreme Court. I know that they're conservative and and, and conservative and liberal, mm-hmm. but I don't see them that way. I see them as I see them as constitutional scholars who apply the law the way they see it. And that's a side note. 
But Justice Roberts had to get involved and say that there's no Obama judges, there's no Bush judges, there's no you know Clinton judges. There are judges, and a judge takes an oath to you know adhere to the law. To the U.S. and that not and that the, and that that, that judge and that circuit ruled accordingly, which stated that people that come to the United States and seek asylum must be given the opportunity to apply to apply for asylum. Period. That doesn't mean we're going to let everybody in because it's all fear mongering, well, right? That, but that's like that's like applying for a job. Doesn't mean you're going to get it. Exactly. But everybody has to have right. the opportunity to apply. Right. Exactly. Right. It's all fear mongering. It's all the tactics of his administration. It's fear mongering to get his base riled up. The caravan is coming. The caravan is coming, and they're going to take. They're going to take. They're going to take your white children at night. They're going to take your white children. <laughs> the caravan is coming. You know, and they're like, going to go to Six Flags. Right. Right. So that caravan is bad. But the caravan that Dawa in Charlotte's, uh, in, uh, what was it, in, in, in Charlottesville or whatever, yeah, sure with their little tikis, that caravan we're not going to talk about. Like no, that's how we're, that caravan we're not going to talk about. But the caravan of these people coming, are there, are there people in the caravan that are probably gang members and delinquents and all that? Of course. But you know what? Cuando vino el Mariel... Okay, right. which which is our people. Let's not forget that for many years people looked at Maria down at Marielitas because it was like, oh, tú eres Marielita, but you know the people that came in Mariel, and we all know that most people that came in Mariel were good and honest people that came to this country to work and get ahead. Right? That's what we know. That's what we know. How is this any different? How is this any different? And how he uses the word invasion. How is this any different than in Mariel? Because in Mariel, it was tens of thousands of people coming into the U.S. Ugh, and they let in Ingrid. Ugh. Ugh. Um, <laughs> and um, in, it was tens of thousands of people coming into the U.S. How is that invasion any different than the people coming now? It's different when you arrive by boat. So that that's 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 my problem with 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 everything from the president and the comments that he's making and his administration, you know, to the fear mongering to so many people in our community, you know, forgetting where they came from and how they got to this country. It's 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 just shameful. It's just shameful. We have we are a country of laws. So if you believe in our country and you believe in our constitution and you believe in our branches of government, you need to let our branches of government do what they need to do. That's how it's always been. So you need to again, if you if you so believe in the constitution and our forms of government, then you need to let our government and its structure work accordingly. Fair enough. He dicho caso cerrado. Ay, anyway, me subió la presión. No, ya veo. Ya veo. You're looking so, so like, you know, it's like you have rosacea. Ay, let's talk about kissing. Okay, who do we want to kiss? It's not who we want to kiss. It's who kissed who. Oíste. Who's who, man, who? <laughs> Oíste. Uh, I know you're going to like this one. <laughs> la mierda que están hablando over that picture that David Beckham posted this week. What kissing picture? his daughter. David Beckham posted a picture. How do I his, not know something happening? This with has the been Spice everywhere. Girls? It's been everywhere. In, 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 like, how, I even, how old is she now? What's her name? Harper? Emily? Harper. Harper. I think Harper's like six or seven. Okay. So a it's a picture that he posted on Instagram. Um, I'm looking up the picture as I speak so you could see it. Um, of, of him and um, David Beckham. I was going to almost put Victoria. <laughs> Here's a picture. Oh, what a cute picture. Right, it's him skating in, in Rockefeller, Rockefeller or whatever. Uh -huh. um, a picture of him kind of like pop kissing her in the mouth. So, of course. Well, but they're actually, I mean, in that picture at least, it just looks like they're making duck lips at each other. Well, almost. that's the picture right, that's right, in right, controversy. Right. Well, of course, because, you know, everybody has an opinion. It's true. You know, paque fuaque yo. You know, everybody's saying that that's inappropriate and that's, you know, sexual child abuse and, you know, that that shouldn't be and that shouldn't be allowed. And I'm like, oh, who are these people? Come mi does. So what do you think about that? I mean, first of all, fuck off. Um, you know, if he if it was a picture of him like in bed with her and they were like making out and you know and she's wearing like a little cami, I'd be like, okay, yeah, no, we need to investigate. Call DC, call DCF. <laughs> but it's clearly a father and daughter just showing affection for each mm -hmm. other, and I think that's a huge problem with this. I don't want to say this country, this society. I don't even know where to stop anymore. 
people tend to get number one se meten en lo que no le importa yeah okay like that show on ABC eh, who do you think you are uh-huh. no um, what would you do uh huh as I call it metidos y chismosos do you know what I always think of when I see that show when they say the title what I always think what would you do when your man is at home crying all alone <laughs> in the bedroom floor cause he's hungry <laughs> <laughs> because you know what there are certain things that you shouldn't it's not that you shouldn't get involved in it's just it's none of your damn business yeah. second of all it also comes back to just this whole thing about like no that's not the proper way to show affection you know and it's like well who, fuck you Who's who are you to tell me what is proper to you know show affection I mean it could be something as simple as you know and you and your family, like, I mean, you want to talk about a family that almost makes out with each other every time they see each other. You guys are super affectionate. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic, you know. But there are people who will be like, you know, oh, you know, why do you, two guys, you know, kiss each other, you know, on the cheek? Oh, that's so gay or that's so inappropriate or, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. And it's like, no. It's, Welcome to my family. Exactly. We all kiss each other. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no. It's about, it, life is about context. Mm-hmm. If you see somebody and you, oh my God, how are you? And you give each other a kiss or whatever, that's not sexual assault, mm-hmm. first of all. Um, you know, and second of all, it's you don't know the relationship between these two people. I think that this is, and I think that's super cute. I, See, you after the other I would, I would like kiss my nephews on the mouth, like you know, like, like that, like just like a. I know? think that this is another example of what you and I have always said many, many times here. The great thing about social media and the internet is everybody that it gave a everybody a voice. Mm-hmm. The bad thing is that it gave everybody a voice because you know the stupid ass banshees out there that have nothing else to do that want to pass judgment on everybody, but probably you know think. Of themselves a very holy. I'm very fired up today, aren't you I? You are fired up I for am. seven o'clock on a, on a Thursday. <laughs> um, no, this, it's Friday. Is this? Well, yeah, we're not. It's fake Friday. It's fake Friday, fake Friday for us, but real Friday is this because for you. NBC no longer has must see TV. <laughs> you just so riled up. I still miss the friends. Yeah, I feel you do. Um, you know, of people riled up, passing judgment. You know, and no se miran lo de ellos because that's his daughter. It's his picture again, as you said. It's not like there's tongue involved. It's like a. It's like a pop kiss kind of sort right. of. It's his daughter. So what if he wants to pop kiss his daughter or his sons or whomever? They, I mean, it's his os- offspring. You know, that's their problem. I'm going to go on the record as saying, David Beckham, you can pop kiss me anytime you want. And then I'll pop kiss Posh. And then we'll do a triple I would, kiss. I would let him. I would pop kiss him only because it would bring me cr- closer to her. <laughs> Cause it, right, because it's David Beckham, right? Right, right. That's like people are like, oh my God, you know. I'd be like, listen. I Anything would, that I, brings you closer to Victoria, right? Well, that. But I'm like, listen, I would kiss Steve Buscemi. Oh. But it's still, but you know what? what? Did you ever kiss an actor of that, of that caliber? I don't think so. There you go. Um... <laughs> But you know anything that brings you closer to Victoria, and if you if you get Victoria, then you yeah, get Jerry and all the rest of the girls. I go with Jerry just because we share a birthday. But yeah, yeah. Well, she is your favorite. She is my favorite. Yeah. And ho- hopefully, we'll get to see her. Oh, by the way, it's uh, the Spice Girls reunion tour. Mm. It's officially the Spice World Tour 2019. Oh, it's been renamed. Yeah, you know what that means. That yeah, they're coming. They're crossing the pond. They're but that's a pond. that's a talk for another day. That's a talk for another day. Yeah, that's yeah. We have to figure that one day. out. But kind of actually just touching base for one minute on the whole the whole David Beckham thing. It's funny because, to your point of, you know, people like to, to criticize and throw stones and, you know, everybody else. Da, da, da. It reminds me of, like, those people on social media who tend to get riled up and talk about, like, how they don't give a shit. You know, the haters and the haters hate on their life and da, da, da. Mm-hmm. Am I the only one who noticed that most people who say things like that have lives that absolutely nobody envies? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's how it is. It's, it's like... like- you're talking about who who who's hating you? Mm-hmm. The homeless people? Mm-hmm. Like they're the only think, ones who do you could think look you're up that, to you. Do you think you're that special? That yeah, people... exactly. Like no, you no no. I no. Sorry. It's terrible. No. So <laughs> on that note, on that note, <laughs> it's time for our interview. Yes, it and is. And we have a great interview today. Yes, we had the interview with one of the founders of the Cuba One Foundation, Sheree Casio, as well as one of the alumni of the program who actually I think she's gone on multiple trips with them mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken uh, her name is Victoria Frey it's a great conversation they're a great organization they're actually it's a very interesting story how it actually started mm-hmm. and I don't want to get too into it because that's what the interview's for but hope you enjoy so here's our interview 
Hey caballero, you know if there's one thing we love here at Pero Let Me Tell You, it's tradition. And what better way to keep that tradition going than with some cigars from our friends at Tres Lindas Cubanas. That's right, you heard them on our show here recently. These ladies are offering you a fantastic opportunity to get a cigar holiday gift pack that you can order online. Free shipping, and if you use the code Better Let Me, you'll get a free gift with every purchase. As you probably heard on our interview with these ladies, these cigars are high quality, the epitome of urban sophistication, and it's a company from two Afro Cuban twin sisters, okay? Hello, representa la gente, right? So go to treslindascubanas.com today and order your holiday gift. It's perfect. You know what? Not just for a gift. Get it for yourself. Come on. What are you waiting for? You know you want to. And don't forget to use the promo code Better Let Me to get a free gift with every purchase. Hey, listeners. Thanks for coming back. So as we mentioned, we are here with one of the founders of the Cuba One Foundation, Cherie Cancio. And we are also here with one of the alum, Victoria Freire. So thank you, ladies, both for joining us. It's an interesting dynamic we've got going here because one of you's on Skype, one of you's here in person, and this is the first time we've done something Hi, like Leah, this. Hi, Chicago. We're everywhere, <laughs> Thank you right? for better. Thank you for being on Thank you. Thank you. And, I mean, this is the first in-person and Skype yeah, interview. So, yeah. so thank oh, you for awesome. being our first in that Pioneering, regard. Um, right? Yeah. Yes, um, we're here to help. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Chicago and Hialeah are kind of similar. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right? They both yeah. have sure. rivers. Yeah. We, yeah, Somewhere. Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. Um, and that's about it. They yeah. Both, yeah, not even the pizza's the same. <laughs> They're both thick. <laughs> They're both thick. That's true. Thick, that's so. true. That's true. So, Cherie, I guess we'll start off with you as, you know, as the founder of the Cuba One Foundation. Can you give us a little bit of, you know, just a recap of exactly what is the mission statement of the Cuba One Foundation? Because obviously we've looked it up, but it's always better to hear it from the founder. Yeah, for sure. I will give us an abbreviated version of what our mission, essentially the Cuba One Foundation is really at the heart of it, a reconciliation program Mm -hmm. or a foundation where we are, um, A, really wanting to connect um, Americans of Cuban descent or Cuban, Americans with their peers on the island. So for bringing an artist or a writer or a lawyer, we want them to connect with people on the island and stay connected. And that's part of our reconciliation process. B, we want people to see Cuba today and kind of build their own narrative of the idea of what does it mean to be Cuban? What does it mean to be of Cuban descent and what that identity looks like? Um, And then ultimately um, really is to bridge um, the gap between the diaspora here in the States and then the Cuban people on the island. How did this idea come to you? I mean, obviously being Cuban American, one would say, well, yeah, duh, but lots of Cuban Americans didn't have the idea. So how did you guys, you and your your partners? Right. Um, So I have a very different story than the rest of my founders. So I grew up with Cuba very near and dear to my heart. I traveled to Cuba for the first first time when I was four years old Oh wow! Oh, okay. um, with my mother actually who's Puerto Rican so my <laughs> father came over through Marien and he wanted us me to go back as a four-year-old to meet my grandfather I was the first grandchild in the family and then he wasn't allowed to go because at that time Cubans who had exiled right. could not return so my mother decided with my father um blessing it to go forth and that was the first interaction I had with Cuba so I have pictures of myself with my grandfather during the special period in Mm -hmm. Cuba during that time walking the same streets my father walked this was the 90s right this was the the fall of the Soviet Union right going and swimming in the same pool my father did when he was doing water polo visiting his schools um going to Valero going to La Habana Vieja so that was my first initial experience with Cuba and then I went back when I was 22 So I met my aunts for the first time at four and they didn't meet me until I was 22. And ever since I went, my family would go back every New Year's and spend New Year's with my family there. So Cuba was very personal and very family connection there. And a lot of my experience as being Cuban was through the eyes of my father. When I, I left Miami and came back five years later, I was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Very different. Came back, went to (laughs) Cuba. Just as hot though. Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> just as hot, culture, food, the whole the whole yeah. thing. Um, came back around the same time that President Obama announced um, the re-engagement with the two countries. Went to Cuba, came back, and had a complete different experience than I ever had with this news. And that night I was on Facebook, and on Facebook I had another friend named Giancarlo Sopo that I knew in college, just came back from Cuba. 
and we were talking about this experience that we both had. We both had been to Cuba before. We went back and had kind of like an epiphany of our new experience. Like, what is our role in this new landscape now that there's changes within both governments? And the last thing that Giancarlo said to me on Facebook Messenger was, do you know what birthright Israel is? And I said, yes. And then he said, imagine if there was a birthright Israel or birthright for our community. And then he logged Mm -hmm. off. And so the next day, we met Eversize for breakfast. So he planted that seed. He planted that seed. He was thinking about it through the conversation. We went to Versailles for breakfast three months later. Because Giancarlos and I are not the... We had all these ideas. We're already thinking about branding. But we weren't thinking about how we're funding this, how we're doing the program. Out of right. local, right? In the weeds. Right. Yeah, Just like, we that. have this great idea. And we started meeting a bunch of people. Four months later, we got connected with Daniel Jimenez and Andrew Jimenez, who are cousins. Had the same idea on the other side (laughs) we had dinner at versailles and then we asked the same question in that space what would happen if and we looked around the room if we took all of their kids back to cuba how would that change our community here um so that was the spark to our foundation a few months later obama visited cuba Mm -hmm. and we decided we are going to put the money together ourselves and we need to launch this we want to be a part of this reconciliation process um, between both of our communities. Oh, that's fantastic. Wow. That's, that's why I love that how Versailles play a huge role in this. It, it was, it was <laughs> we could have picked any other place in Miami, right? We could have stayed in Hialeah. We could have went to Kendall. None of us are from Little Havana, and we were like, let's just meet at Versailles. Right. Let's now, go to Croquet and Hupian. What did you and, find? <laughs> um, she listens. I do. <laughs> <laughs> what did you find initially? So you you start the program. What was the initial response? From who? Well, I was going <laughs> to let you take the reins on that because I feel that, and again, from personal experience, mm-hmm. adults and exiled have a very different mm-hmm. outlook on that than our generation. Yeah. Um, so I imagine that you probably got all types of reactions. Very polarizing. So f- interesting enough, we launched with the New York Times article, right? So we're launching outside of our own community. Right. So the reaction was you had Cuban Americans in New York, Cuban Americans from Chicago, like like Victoria, and then us here. Um, it was very different. The way we launched was like the New Tropic, the Miami Two Times. We were yeah. really gearing towards our peers or quote unquote millennials in that space. I was actually shocked that we didn't get stronger reaction or backlash. So I think we were kind of riding the Obama wave during that space of like opening of of that. Um, Where we hit some of that polarization was when we first got our first cohort. So we take 10 people for a free trip to Cuba. So that's essentially what the program is. And then we were getting people calling us, how do I have conversations with my parents? My mother is, Mm. my mother, they did this and this to my parents and they're not, I have goosebumps now. And I they're worried about what's going on. They want to meet you. They don't trust this organization. Um, So we started doing, we always do a dinner before each trip. Mm -hmm. And so we started opening up based off of that, like invite your grandmother, invite your mother, call us, we'll speak to your mom. So we started putting even like systems, like very strategic systems, like every day we send out an email to parents. Mind you, our group is 22 to 36. We just we're sending em- it. we just missed, we just missed <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and we're sending emails to parents letting them know here goes pictures of your kids grown <laughs> adult kids here goes feedback on it here goes the background on each one of us have come and have lechon at frijole in little havana meet us see us understand this mission know it's from the heart and then also like coming back from that so a lot of the coming back part i think it's more strong than initial going forward because uh, we then we have people coming back and telling their parents, Cuba's like this, and I went to this place, and I went to this restaurant. And a lot of the parents are like, that's not what I've been hearing. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of um, friction in those spaces. So we, we a lot of what we spend time is like supporting how those conversations go. But as far as the larger community, I, I was here in the 90s where, so my father used to bring Cuban musicians to Miami. I was here in Miami where there were more people outside protesting than people inside. Mm -hmm. Um, We didn't see that. Do you think a part of that is because ultimately your mission is about reconnecting people to their culture? And it's not about 
a political, political you know side right. either way and people probably can get behind that a little bit more because if the one thing Cubans here in Miami and Exile love is to figure out how to make their kids more Cuban. I so, think we focusing on like what makes you Cuban I think was a huge part. The other thing that we touched on is family reunification. So grandparents were giving their kids pictures of where they grew up. They were connecting and calling their family for the first time. We had a team on the ground of people that we built our network that would go and research, like, is this address still there? Is the house still there? Is that family member still there? And then we would reconnect them. So I think those stories were coming back and people were interested in the human aspect of like what we were connecting. Um, and then we would have people who would go and come back feeling... 200% more Cuban than they when they originally went. So now they're coming to Miami to visit me, to have Croqueta and Versailles, to go to Hialeah. I gave one of our participants their first um, batido de mame. What? Like, because they were in New York and they didn't grow up with a strong Cuban community. <laughs> so now they're gravitating to Miami and they're really searching on like, how can I stay connected with Cuba? Is it a croqueta? Does it mean me speaking Spanish? And we also take people who never speak Spanish, who spoke Spanish all their lives, who are half Cuban. So the idea of what makes you Cuban is also like a constant question during the trip. And it's fascinating to see like what actually makes you feel Cuban. Now, what would you say? Because this is, you know, when, when you talk Cuba... Ra you know, being rational is not part of the conversation. No. Contra it's, it's, contradictions everywhere. It, it, contradictions, it's very emotional. Mm -hmm. So as you were saying earlier, speaking to the parent of these kids or to the older generation that exiled, mm -hmm. um, it's very hard to have a rational conversation with them for reasons that we're all we all know. So, you know, for example, like my father, my father's family were counter revolutionists. Mm -hmm. So you know, he has a very, yeah. very strong opinion about people that go back to Cuba. And he's not shy to tell mm -hmm. you. So what would you... We're not shy people. What <laughs> would you tell somebody like that? You know, these hard-lined, you know, exiled Cubans that believe that, no, you don't go to Cuba because we fled communism and there's no reason why you need to go back. So I, I would speak on my behalf. I think fundamentally... On Cuba One's behalf, we respect all of our stories, right? Like speaking our truth is something that we we cannot do what we're doing unless we're respecting what happened before us. There, I'm not here true. because my father came here voluntarily. That I, that's fundamentally I have to understand that. Um, but from a personal perspective, I also have to understand, and I will say that this is also something that I learned from my father. It's not something that one day I had an epiphany on. So my experience has been very different. I didn't have a friction in my own household over that. My grandfather is probably the only one that there's some friction, but he's a little bit more removed for me. Um, I cannot inherit my father's or my grandfather's hatred towards another group of people or another country. Not my father, but my grandfather, Rancor. I have to respect it. I have to acknowledge right. it. Right. But for me to inherit that, um, and not be able to connect my own understanding of what that journey meant and my own understanding of um, what he went through before coming here, um, I think takes away from the fundamental experience of being first generation anything. Then once you meet the people there, once I meet other 31 year olds doing amazing things, working in a foundation, starting their own design shop, starting a restaurant, mm -hmm. it's hard for me to say I'm not going to continue connecting to that. Right. So I think for me, fundamentally, it's like, I need to respect that. I need to acknowledge it. I understand our stories. I understand why we're here. Like, Hylia is an example of those travesties that happened in Cuba and what we did in this community. But I fundamentally cannot inherit those right. feelings as well. Um, and so... We as an organization respect that and we're open to those conversations and that's why we support our, even our alumni and our participants when they're going through that and how now when we're talking about Cuba, whether you come back from the trip agreeing with your father or disagreeing with your father, you're talking about Cuba from your from your eyes, from right. what you're seeing on not the ground. Not from what they told you. Right. You're talking about it from it from not nostalgic conversations or with cafecito mm -hmm. in Versailles. You're talking about it from what's actually going on on the island. And like if you come back as hardliner as your 
exile community is or as somebody who wants to continue on with reconciliation you're talking about it from your personal perspective it's funny because like on a personal note um i'm writing a book for my grandmother um my grandmother was raised in a ch children's asylum in mm. cuba and i'm about 75 percent done with the book wow. but a portion of the book is her in the asylum mm -hmm. and i I can't write about something that I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I do want to go to Cuba because the building actually still exists mm -hmm. where she's at, where she was raised. Um, I want to go and see it so it could influence my writing. And I told my father, I want you to go with me. And I'm going to go regardless. I'm going to go whether you go or not. I just prefer if you go with me because I'm going to go. Mm -hmm. And um, and he's like, well... The conversation chases. Yes, yeah. yes. Yes. So, I mean, I think that what you guys are doing are great because you're going to the emotion of it and not the politics. We're and going to the people, the heart of what our, where our community's at. And I, I could be bluffing our numbers, but I would guess 75% of our participants have gone back with their families. Right. And when they're going back, they're reaching back out to us. How, how do we have this conversation? Um, where should we be staying? My mother wants to go back. She wants to go with us. So it's not, we could only take 10 people. Right, so we do what four trips a year. We have a hundred alumni now, mm -hmm. but the amount of people that they're taking back, and whether it's grandparents, right. parents, brothers, and siblings, just multiplies what that conversation looks like. And what um, and Vicky, maybe you. Yeah, could, I was gonna say you could we, jump in. Vicky, being one of the alumni, yeah. can probably speak a little more to yeah. that experience of what you feel once you're there and how it translates once you're back and you know with with your family i guess and i don't know what you were gonna I didn't well mean i was gonna you, ask sorry. both of you um uh, i mean vicky's obviously been be, been on one of your trips mm -hmm. and you've been several times what surprised you the most from our trips or from cuba from cuba hmm um i would say because that's a hard question because every time i go i'm surprised by something i'm always telling people cuba is an island full of contradictions. Right. It's an island full of contradictions. It's an island that um, has stood s still in time, but it's also, if you talk to the people and the opening of Wi-Fi, it's progressively forward. Um, I would say what surprises me is the people. Th people who, beyond our odds, are, what are, what is our Cuban saying? Está en la lucha always. Mm -hmm. right. And I think... Growing up in Miami Lakes, Hialeah, and I go back to Cuba and I see people my own age, I'm like, it clicks. Now I know why a community like Miami was built by us. Because how it could happen. How it could happen. Because right. um, despite not having the resources, despite not having the opportunities, they are hustling, they are luchando, they are doing the best they can for their situation. They're doing it um, with the same humor we have here. Um, the food might look a little different, um, the music might sound a little different. People. It, I mean, it just surprises me every time I walk into a new private enterprise um, and see young people learning from what they're seeing on YouTube and learning from what they're seeing on the internet and taking that. And so fashion, music, the way um, they kind of see the world, I think it's always fascinating and surprises me when I go. I would have to agree. I would say the most surprising thing is the people in the sense that I grew up in Miami and my parents were not uh, necessarily hardliners. Uh, <laughs> my my mother went back for the first time in 1998 and uh, she went to go see the Pope and she worked uh, a lot uh, trying to, you know, kind of fight against the embargo, which people in Miami <laughs> did not care for. <laughs> um, my dad was a, That's an was a still not happy about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I kind of had um, Cherie and I when we first met, we bonded over this a little bit because, you know, some of like she said, all those protests. There were more people outside than inside. I definitely felt some of that growing up, just towards my mother and my because of my mother's opinions. But when you're removed from the island, we all have all these ideas and all these notions of what should be happening there and it really isn't until you go and you speak to the people who are living it that you can understand like hey we need to take a step back and and almost like shut up and listen you know like 
I, you, we need to hear from them. How do they want their home to change? And what struck me the most, uh, especially from my trip, I, I had been one time before very briefly to Havana for about three days, really fast whirlwind. I was with my mom and I got this experience to go with Cuba One. And the first thing they did was pick us up from the airport and we went straight to El Campo in Pinar de Rio, in Nice. And <laughs> it was just the, the sense of community between the Cuban people. It, it, they do what they can with what they have. And they have this strong sense of, you know, these intergenerational houses and then the neighbors help each other out. And it's so familiar because of how things run in Miami and how things are in Hialeah. But at the same time, you hear from them and they are really, they don't want to lose that. They don't want to lose that sense of community. So I was just very surprised to hear what they had to say about us and how their opinions about us have changed and how our opinions about them had changed just based on things that we had heard our whole lives. You know, you never know until you get there. Right. So it's, definitely. It's, it's very interesting you're saying that because since I grew up with like the hardline rhetoric as I was talking about it, I had this kind of perception that cute people in Cuba like lived practically in huts. Like they had nothing. Right. They couldn't, hand they to barely hand could to mouth, eat. Yeah. I mean, they barely had electricity, you know. Mm -hmm. That's how extreme, I, that's the rhetoric I grew up with. And I'll never forget that in the early 90s, I there was a, a, a relative of ours that came from Cuba and she was young, she was in her 20s and she loved Pearl Jam. And I'm like, but Where how do you know mm -hmm. Pearl Jam? You're in Cuba. You're supposed to be like, you know, a fourth world country. You know? One of my best friends in Cuba, her English was very odd to me. I was like, where did you get your accent? And she was like, oh, I learned English by watching Friends. <laughs> she sounds like Monica on Friends. So you're like, how are you watching Friends? I haven't watched Friends in forever. They so figured every, out. Time, every time you say and, something, she just goes, I know. Yeah. They're just like, they're looking at movies and they're, they're like absorbing all of that. And then you're like, how is this happening in this space where I thought those things weren't coming here? One of our guides said that, uh, Yeni, that she learned her, uh, English from like music, like American music. And it was so fascinating to hear uh, what they had to say. That's, that's, well, that's awesome. I mean, there's no other way to put it. Yeah. yeah. So. I have a question, and I'm going to direct it to you, Vicky, but I guess I'll, you know, obviously, Sheree, mm -hmm. feel free to jump in. I guess there it may not be any such thing as a typical trip, but understanding that the goal is promoting culture and reconnecting with that culture, you know, what does a itinerary kind of look like? You know, you get there, you're there for how many days? Uh, seven. For whole, you know, for seven days, for a whole week. Mm -hmm. What happens in that week? And I, I guess it could fluctuate, but, it, you know, an, an overview. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, it's, it's so much happened. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, from the airport in Miami to the last day, I, it, we, so a basic overview of our itinerary was uh, three days in Vinales, which were very much like countryside activity oriented. So we saw a tobacco farm. We watched uh, a farmer hand roll a cigar in front of us in about 30 seconds. It was the most incredible thing wow. I've ever seen. Um, uh, rode horseback, uh, danced in the town square, mm -hmm. went to a bar that was like built into a cave. And then after all of that, we got back on the bus and we headed to Havana for, what was it four or five days, right, Cherie? Yes. And it was, it's just completely different. And I had already been to Havana one time before, but nobody else on the trip had. So it was quite a change and quite a, a shock, to be quite honest, um, just because of the difference between a huge city and the countryside. Uh, so we spent, you know, four days just making connections going to events that were thrown by my fellow co cohorts. Uh, we had one guy that worked for Instagram who did an event for like influencers in Cuba. So he was just teaching them how to better use Instagram to grow a following. So we got to see that. We got to experience uh, Glandestina, which is 
a small uh, independent shop that's growing now. They sell on Amazon. They taught us Geo. how to Geo. Geo. Talk, 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 talk to us yeah. about that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what? We, we had a previous we had a previous guest um, Giovanni he's uh, one of the uh, PR people for Bacardi yeah. mm-hmm. and um, he goes to Cuba and he was talking to us about that that very exact brand. same brand, yeah. Um, that how it's, yeah. it's really coming. He was coming wearing about. a shirt from there. When yeah, we interviewed him. Yeah. He said, "I think I, I'd rather be in Havana." It, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was incredible to see the work that they're doing because it's it's very in your face, and that's another misconception. You, not you. I'll speak for myself that I may have had about Cuba. Like, oh, they're all very. You know, they have to watch what they say. They have to watch what they do, and right. they're very in your face about their their stuff. And so it was heartening to see that kind of bubbling under the surface um so we just got to experience all these different kinds of businesses different kinds of um restaurants we stayed with um a family at a casa particular and they were incredible they were just this young couple who bought a building and they were both dancers and they just treated us like their family they made us breakfast every morning cafecito and it it was staying in Centro Havana with them was life changing. And then beyond the itinerary, Cuba One does a, a fantastic job curating their group. My group, they're like my primos now. Like we talk <laughs> all the time. And I, I'm a chatty person and I'm very I I I open up real easily. And so I, I was nervous that okay, nobody's going to be talking after like a week. And we're still talking. And we went in April. So it's it just opens up all these connections. And having people there that have had this similar experience, you know, some are first gen, some are second gen. And we all got to experience this together to the point where we came up with like a, almost like a slogan for our trip, which was CAF, Cuban as F. <laughs> we all felt so, so Cuban which was so bizarre because obviously we're very American in a way. And for me as a first generation person, I always kind of felt like I am of both worlds, but simultaneously I am of none. Right. So That's exactly how going it is. home, quote unquote, it just reaffirmed like, okay, I am from this place. Like this is my, these are my people. These are my people. So we, we did, we did everything. We had fun. We had emotional moments. We saw businesses. We got to wander around. Uh, it, it was just incredible. And then on top of all that bonding with the people that you're with, which I'm sure you all know, traveling with people can be very hard. There was no problems on that end. We were all just like, you know, primos from otros tios or whatever the phrase may be. <laughs> um, even, you know, the cohorts that were from New York, which I thought, okay, they're, you know, going to be different. And then halfway through the trip, I'm like, wow. So they're extremely Miami, which I guess is not Miami. It just means Cuban. Right. Like they could have been from Miami. It was incredible. Let me ask you a more personal question. Um, because I feel, as you mentioned at the beginning of the, of the, of the conversation that one of the things that inspired you was, you know, when Jews go back to, Israel mm-hmm. and, and all that. So th- this is definitely um, a, a an emotional trajectory. What did you? What would you say you found out about yourself that maybe you didn't know before you went on this trip? Hmm, that's a that's an excellent question. I I think that mostly getting to I carve my own narrative of Cuba was extremely important to me, and I feel like I really surprised myself with how much I got to do that. Um, I, you know, my vision of Cuba growing up is these black and white photos that were smuggled out. It's stories from other people. It's, you know, my dad telling me bedtime stories. And at a certain point, you know, as, as, as you had mentioned, you know, I need to experience something to write about it. I'm the, I'm kind of the same and just getting to, to go there. And I surprised myself how much, of my own story I was able to craft just from this seven day experience that it really did kind of strike me as a very surprising. I wasn't sure what to expect. I wasn't sure how emotionally overwhelmed I would be. And maybe I just wanted to move on and not really think about it that much, but I was able to really just craft, you know, my own vision of Cuba and my opinions of what should happen for Cuba 
because of the experience. Right. I think I think it's a great I mean, it's such a great thing because I think that I, and I could speak about this personally. And, and you mentioned it, Vicky, you, you, you touched upon it. I think that when you're first generation anything, um, you always go through a period that you're trying to reconcile exactly mm -hmm. who you are. Because that whole saying, you know, specifically to Cubans, I'm too American for the Cubans and too, too Cubans, Cubans for the Americans. Yeah. I mean, that is, that is so true and not to be melodramatic, but you always feel like you're somewhere stuck in the middle. You're mm -hmm. looking in from outside. And, and th that's why I think I asked you that question because you spend a lifetime kind of reconciling exactly who you are. So when you go there and you, as you said, you, you said, these are my people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't feel they're your people through somebody else's stories, you know. Um, it, you have to feel it yourself. Now, was this when you started this whole organization? Because obviously, when you start anything, you don't know what life it's going to take. Right. Did you envision this being the ultimate goal? Or, you know, because a lot of times people, you know, a lot of people go to Cuba to party. Mm -hmm. So were you afraid that maybe pe a lot of people are going to jump on board that maybe weren't going for maybe the reasons you wanted. So specifically for our trip, no. So the, we curated every part of this process. So I have a nonprofit background. So we had friends who were not who were not of Cuban descent review applications. We have a first initial application process, then you have an essay process. In that essay process, what are you hoping to get from the trip? If you could do a TED talk about your trip, what would it oh, look great. like? What is your family story? Do you have family in Cuba? Have you been to Cuba? And then if you could do anything, a project coming back from that, what would that look like? That project part is where we really look at seeing like, what, what do you, if we were giving you on our end a trip of lifetime for free to go to Cuba, connecting you with your roots, connecting with your family, we pick 20 people board and committee comes together and then we're really curating picking people who would work well together we are hoping to get primos coming out of this right. trip we are hoping to get your uh, your in your google chat your facebook chat your people that when you're in miami you want to go for a month out together those are the people we're looking for um the itinerary set up where you're seeing we're trying to provide you with a glimpse of different facets of cuban life we never set out for this space to be that this should be your only experience of Cuba. We want you to go back. We want you to bring your primo, your tío, your abuela, your friend in those spaces. Because we set it up that way, the idea of people kind of jumping on a bandwagon, just going, was never part of that process, Great. right? Mm -hmm. If you're going to Cuba to do that, that's your prerogative. Again, I respect mm -hmm. what you're doing. But not on your dime. Right. <laughs> and in not in, that's not the goal of our program. <laughs> Our goal of our program is to connect people with their peers on the island, to connect this large network of Cuban Americans or American of Cuban descent together, um, is to start building your own narrative once you're coming back. That, once you start having that mission, and those are the questions you're putting, and those are the people you're selecting, all of those experiences of what you would claim as a tourist experience kind of washes away. The most touristy thing we might do is a classic cart ride mm -hmm. around Havana. And for us, it's because we need you to get a lay of the line, lay of the land, excuse me, because at the end of the day, I need you to go find a taxi, go get an amandron. By day three, we're like, we're not using the vans no more. Figure your way out around Havana. If you're gonna go out, figure your way out. Let's talk about it the next day. How was your experience? How was your experience getting a taxi, getting in a car, uh, using the different monies, seo se versus the peso? What is your experience? So all of those things that we strategically put in the program allows for those experiences to happen. And if you decide to use that to meet people in, in a fun bar in Vinales, great. But then the next day, we're going to go meet a community organizer. Wow. Who is doing work with kids and, and we're bringing donations for really them are getting the um, full spectrum we're getting of, pieces of, of that community. spectrum Absolutely. right and then when you're going back that means you could be going back to another part of the island because that's where your family from mm -hmm. and then we're building all these different experiences that are happening so i have a question that's kind of from a selfish perspective why the cutoff point why not have it be like maybe 40 year old podcasters uh, you know can go <laughs> we did a lot of research on nonprofits. 
specifically nonprofits that birthright Israel, nonprofits that focus on a certain age range. Mm-hmm. Then we also looked at our own demographic. If we're thinking of opinions are changing and transitioning from the exile community to this new generation, right. um, what are, what does that generation look like? 22 to 36. Originally, we were going to do a little bit younger, and then we were like, wait. <laughs> then we don't want to get into that. Let's yeah. go. That's the Let's party go have people. a cristal everywhere, right? Yeah. And then we were looking for people who were on the cuffs of being um, somebody that in a few years could do amazing things and could tie that, okay. use this experience to kind of tie what they're doing in the space of Cuba and Cuban Americans in our in our community. Um, and essentially, we're giving out free trips. So if you're over 36, probably afford to go and we could help you out and we could give you suggestions. But that was like our sweet spot when we first thought about it. We have two board members that are like, they're not, if they were to apply, they wouldn't be able to go because of their ages. So we were like very strategic on why we picked those spaces. But we get that question all the time. So basically you and I are too arretuol to go. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, we're going to have to consult with them when we're going to have to, yeah, we're going to take this offline. We can do a different trip. Yeah. What does that look like? I I hate to ask this question, but I feel that it's something that people may be thinking. Whenever you've gone there, and Vicky, you could jump in as well, did you ever feel you're being watched? Yes and no. I would say that because based on what we hear here, I'm going to naturally have the inclination once I go there. Um, I'm going to naturally just like shit. I'm surprised and how open they are. And as soon as they do that, I'm like, did anybody hear that? Right. Um, so I, I also think that's just like vicariously thinking about the exile stories that I have heard growing up it's and ingrained. reading books. It's ingrained in your, as soon as I get there, where am I at? So I think I have that feeling when I go because of that. Have I seen it? No. Right. Um, and I've been traveling back and forth to the island since I was 22. I've gone on every trip what one with Cuba One and leading it. Um, so I think a lot of it's just like when I think of Cuba before I started going to Cuba regularly. What are what are you usually hearing? You there we there are people everywhere. And so what does that look like? Um, but that's the best way I could answer that. Fair enough. Fair enough. How about you, Vicky? Uh, honestly, I I never got that feeling ever mm-hmm. while we were there. Um, I I would say maybe it's something that crossed my mind just again because of the stories that we grew up with in Miami. But personally, I never felt uncomfortable in that sense. Mm-hmm. All of the quote unquote discomfort I felt was just emotional. Uh, maybe oh, I'm tired. I'm hot but never uncomfortable like the government's watching us or right. they're taking notes like that was never ever a fear or discomfort that i had on the trip right now where do you see i mean obviously this has been very successful mm-hmm. where do you see the foundation going good question um i think our first meeting that we had together where we were like what is our mission what are we going to do long term we hired a consultant and he was like long term what would be your ultimate goal and we were stuck and we were like really right now this is what we want to focus on and he eventually said um our ultimate goal is to have one our one of our alums be the next mayor of miami oh wow and i think what that speaks to is not necessarily the concept of the next mayor i think what that speaks to is We want the next time the conversation comes up about Cuba that people are talking about it from their perspective of going. And hopefully they've gone with us. The second thing I would say long term is personally I would like to see really strong connections between people that we're connecting Vicky with on the island. What what would that look like in five, ten years? What would that look like with opening of Wi-Fi and opening of travel with the people that she met, whether it's clandestina, whether it's the community project that we visited? How would both of those people be transformed based on their connection? Um, Yeah. I mean, when we first started it, like long term like that was inconceivable, right? Even at that point, just the fact that things opened every time something started, um, and Airline there had been started going like that before. Right. 
airline started going over there. Uh, Madonna went. All these artists were going. All those things were like, we would have never conceived that when we started this. So every time somebody asks me that, I'm like, what could possibly happen with somebody like Vicky five to ten years from now and her connection with Cuba? I don't know. But the fact that that it's even a possibility now is right now good enough for me. Wow. That's fantastic. Now, something I do want to and uh, ask you both about is the balance of the Cuba that, you know, as you said, that, you know, time stood still that has it's stuck in 1959 mm-hmm. and that that charm for better or for worse mm-hmm. versus commercialization because obviously when you know the policy with cuba changed what everybody started saying was like oh before you know it, there's going to be a starbucks mm-hmm. a McDonald's, in cuba, yeah. a mcdonald's right so where do you see that balance? Is that even possible? Well, is that even possible? Where do you see that? Because obviously, the, 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 as I said, the charm of Havana, for example, is that, mm-hmm. that in part it's stuck in time. So wh- how do you see that balance if happening? I had somebody ask me this um, before, and my answer is always... I don't know how I would want to see it. My question would be asking that same question for the 30-year-old Cuban girl, woman in Cuba. How do they want to see it? If we're talking about commercialization in Havana, maybe it's not a Starbucks. Maybe it's a coffee shop run by young Cuban women. Maybe it's not the next McDonald's. Maybe it's an hamburguesa stand led by young Cuban men who are using this to start building their own um, businesses in their own future. I hope that when those decisions are being made, that young Cubans are at the forefront of those decisions, that they're a part of it and that their their progress and their opportunities are at the forefront of that. Um, My hope is not to see Starbucks and McDonald's there, but a evolution of what that looks like for Cubans, clandestina. Mm-hmm. Uh, where clandestina is not guess, it is not gap. It is a Cuban right. brand in Cuba. That you could started only by find there. Cuban right. women that you could only find there. My hope is that you have more of those around the island. But ultimately, if my Cuban friends want a McDonald's in Cuba, then they deserve a McDonald's in Cuba. Sure, you can't see me shaking my head yes very intensely. <laughs> I 100% agree with that assessment. Um, you know, how do you how do we know Cubans don't want a McDonald's? Right. They might, right. you know, right. um and and that goes back to my point of you know, kind of quieting down a little bit and listening. Mm-hmm. And that is such a huge part of this organization's mission. Is, is to connect us with our peers on the island so we can just listen to them and then we can come back to the United States and we can advocate for them and we can say, hey, listen, like this is what they want. Like, for example, I and I, I know people who have gone to Cuba and I, I'm sure this happens in other, you know, developing countries. This idea of, oh, you know, I, I loved going and just being disconnected. It was so great to be off of my phone and off of Wi-Fi and it's just so this and that. And I'm kind of here like, do you know how badly these people are dying to be able to just use their phones Mm -hmm. and use the internet whenever the heck they want? Vicky, you know, so I, I, I can't agree with you enough. I mean, I know you're living in Chicago now. When we I was center hoopinha, hoopinha for that comment. When, no, you deserve all the hoopinhas for that comment because when when everything started thawing between the U.S. and and Cuba, I was living in New York and it would boil my blood when I would hear non-Hispanics because I feel like in general Hispanics kind of get it. You know, obviously if you're not Cuban, it's different, whatever. But they'd be like, "Oh, I want to get there before you know it's ruined." You know, while it's still like rustic or whatever, and it would piss me off because I'd be like, "Listen, if you're getting that much of a hard on over poverty porn, you can go to Flint, Michigan." You know, I, I it's mean, it, don't romanticize the struggle of my people because it's like you said, you know, I get to get away. Here. You know, it's not a sandals resort. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you get to get away from it. And yeah. You can go home at the the afterwards to your air conditioning and, you know, and McDonald's. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
So I'm, I'm glad you said that. It's just, it pisses me off when I hear people romanticizing poverty, essentially. Uh, yeah, it's, it's problematic to say the absolute least. And people who say it, most of the time, they're not doing it from yeah, you know, a bad that. place. But, you know, again, please stop talking and right. think Listen. about what you're saying. Right. You know, these people are huddled on street corners trying to catch the Wi-Fi. Right. And that's just something we can do without thinking about it. Mm-hmm. So why can't they have that, too? Absolutely. They should have that. The, you know, they should be connected in that way. Uh, so I, I would agree with Cherie that there there has to be some kind of balance. And I think the middle balance would be, well, maybe they won't have a McDonald's, but I would like to see a Cuban McDonald's start. A McFrita's. And a Cuban Starbucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A McFrita, whatever, <laughs> you know. Get, let them have the freedom to start those kind of businesses. Absolutely. So, Cherie, I see that you're looking at these pictures. Yeah. Tell us what we're looking at. We are looking at essentially what it is, my business cards. But each of our business cards, we took pictures from our trips. So this one on the left is our second group that we took to Cuba. And the this is them on the money. Second group ever okay. that we took over New Year's in Havana and Pina de Rio. Um, Cuban Americans from all over the country, LA, New York, Miami, Tampa. And then the second one is pictures, a picture that our alum took during the trip of Cubans in La, um, Centro Havana. Just hanging out with um, regular folk. Just hanging out, looking like Cubans that you would see here yeah. on yeah. a stoop. Yeah. And so I love that we did this. Shout out to Daniel for this, because this explains. This is not just a car. This is our story. This is our right. narrative in, in a picture. Right, right. I mean, I think that what you guys are doing is so wonderful. Not Even only if we for can't go. The heritage, <laughs> yes, the, despite the fact you aged us out. <laughs> not only for the heritage factor, but because you're showing what a country really is. Because more often than not, not only in Cuba and anywhere. anywhere, they show you the facade. Like, you could have very easily had the same trip and gone to Varadero mm-hmm. and hang out at a resort and, oh, I'm in Cuba and Varadero drinking water from a coconut and somebody's going to go back and be like, oh, this was my time in Cuba and represent something that mm-hmm. is, partial I don't want to say a farce it's a because, mm-hmm. because it's, it, it is reality, but it's something selective. that doesn't by any means give the whole picture Mm -hmm. or the true picture of what it is to be there so kudos to you for focusing on on that aspect of it so as we wrap wrap our conversation um and i know i say this all the time but i love just talking with people in general so i could be here for hours how can anybody interested get in touch with the organization just uh through the website would that be the easiest way yeah so cuba1.org would be the easiest way to get in contact with us if you we just announced our women's focus trip called Unidas that's going to be going out to Cuba in January. Cara Unidas. Unidas. Oh. Unidas. Unidas. Okay. Yes. Um, and so we are looking for Cuban women, Americans of Cuban descent from all backgrounds, um, queer women, uh, Afro-Cuban women. We want to really show the full spectrum of what it looks and means to be Cuban. If you don't speak Spanish, that's okay. If you speak Spanish, great. If you know what a croqueta is, even better. Um, <laughs> go to our website, cubaone.org, um, and that's where all of our applications kind of come through. Um, or you could shoot me an email, Cherie, C-H-E-R-I-E, at cubaone.org. And of course, we'll have the link, uh, listeners, on our on our details with, you know, when we run the episode, we'll have links to their Instagram page, which has all of your information yes. as well. Yeah. Um, Thank you guys so much. Thank, thank you. you for taking thank you for time. being on the show. But thank, thank you, you for, for having me us. back to Hialeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for what you do because it's something that we really needed. Yeah. And and Vicky, I, thank I you for being so gracious. An <laughs> yeah, and and I'm sure Vicky. I mean, you, I know you're talking to us about your experience, but I'm sure that there's even a portion of it that you couldn't even begin to put into words. Correct. <laughs> I'm trying to in the form of a blog post for Cuba One, but it is uh, it's a lot. Are, is it a blog post for Cuba One proper, or is it through your own blog as well? Um, it's for Cuba One proper, uh, um, but I will probably be sharing it uh, through my blog, through my organization, Everyday Ambassador. Okay. Um, yeah, give yourself a plug, girl. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, um, I'm the COO of Everyday Ambassador, and basically we um, we try to promote you know responsible uh, tourism, responsible uh, volunteering oh, okay. through empathy, humility, uh, focus, and patience. And you can learn more about us at everydayambassador.org. And uh, you'll probably see my blog post up in the next couple of weeks about my trip. Awesome. I may, awesome. Ha- I may have some people I want to put you in touch with, actually, uh, who are currently yeah, traveling great. through um, Eastern Asia. I think they're in right now. And our network multiplies even within this conversation. Yeah. And they're both Yay. Cuban as well. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so thank you both so much for being with us. And, and again, thank you for what you do. Thank you so much. Yeah. I got to get back. Samurai Jack. Never mind. Anyway, welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> uh, caught us in a little moment there. Yeah. Anyway, are we ready for our last Coke? We are ready for our last soda. And actually, we're going we're, we're gonna to kind of mix it up a little bit because it's the holiday season. We've decided that our last sodas during, the, during this season, um, we're actually going to give it to charities and organizations yes. that give back. We do have a heart. We do. Our heart grew four sizes that day. And so, you know, just kind of maybe putting the good word out there so that there's yeah. somebody, maybe some of you feel inclined to help them out and things like that. So, so here we go. Yeah. So, so my my gratuitous, <laughs> loving, charitable, charitable last coke gracious. goes to um, an organization that's very near and dear to me, which is the Guardian at Lightum program. Oh, yes. Um, I've been a Guardian at Lightum for a court-appointed Guardian at Lightum for going on four years. And um, it's one of the most significant things I've ever done in my life. And, you know, I, I always say that when I decided to become a guardian at Lightum, I say two things. I wanted to be part of the solution, not the problem, mm-hmm. because everybody complains and bitches about DCF and how it's, um, you know, how people don't do a good job. Right. And yeah, because DCF is majorly underfunded. Right. And, you know, social workers there have 50, 60, 100 cases per person. Right. And because it's a, a government or state funded program. Right. So I became a volunteer through the Guardian at Lightum program. And, you know, I did it to make a difference, but it changed me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the things that I've seen there, and I've shared them to you, yes, um, yes. the things that I've seen there have been absolutely terrible. Yeah. The way some kids are... I don't are, know how are, you do it. So the way that some kids are brought up, their households, how they're abused, how they're neglected. And, you know, if I could do my part to advocate for these kids in court, um, for their well-being, um, to do my own share, to kind of leave something positive in that child's life... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that I've done my part. And unfortunately, the Guardian at Lightham program, again, like most state agencies, is very underfunded. They need a ton of volunteers. And I can tell you that I really urge people out there to become a volunteer. It, you know. Can you make a donation? If you don't, I mean, people, I don't know. Don't, if, I, don't, don't I, I don't know if they take monetary donations. Is there maybe a way Because they're, they're not really a charity. They're not really a charity. True. But they're a volunteer program. And Do they do any type of... And I, I, I Sorry to interrupt. Because the holidays are here. Do they do any type of like gift collection? Actually, thing? they do. They do. Okay. Um, and I, I, I could find out more information on that. But really, their whole shtick is to right, volunteer. Right. Right. Because the kids need it. And, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of time, but it doesn't. Because... Mm-hmm. You know, you could be have only one child. I mean, I've had I had nine until right. a couple of weeks Ooh, ago. You were like almost a dugger. <laughs> I had nine kids that I was a guardian of, right. and you know, you could have one. You could say, "Hey, look, I I'm you know I work full time. Maybe maybe I'm a single parent. I don't have time right. for this." But you have one, and really, you know, it depends on how involved you want to be in it, how involved you want to be with the children. Mm-hmm. But whether you could be very involved or less involved because of your own life commitments. Correct. It's still something that's really going to help out a child because these kids, I'm telling you, um, the things that I've seen and, and you know, by volunteering, it's just terrible because you hear about child abuse and child neglect, but it's not until you see a child that's gone through that, that your perspective is completely yeah, it different. Puts a, it puts a face on it. It puts a face on it. And, mm-hmm. and so I urge people that it, it's something, it's one of the most selfless things you could do. And I can tell you that you will not regret it and it's one of the greatest things that you could do and and not only are you going to help out a child but you're also going to feel so good about yourself so the guardian at lightum program and all all cities all regions yeah. and have you don't have to be a program. lawyer you don't have to have any legal background you it's don't literally just you representing don't. a child who needs yeah it. you don't i mean if you have a legal background it helps because you advocate in court but i mean you don't there's people there who uh, I'm, i know a, a lady who's a gardener 
like she's professionally yeah she's a gardener she has a gardening company and oh. she's a guardian at litem wow so you know and anybody can do it well that's that's fantastic and i will go ahead and i'm gonna go ahead and speak because i'm gonna i'm gonna brag for you i've seen how you are with these kids not mm-hmm. personally but i've seen the effects and i've seen how it's definitely affected you and i don't know that i could do it but i have so much respect for you for doing it thank like, you it's something that you know, I mean, I have respect for you for other things too, but um, that's one of those things that you do that it seems, I mean, obviously it's very in character for you to do that, mm-hmm. but you're also somebody who up until about a couple years ago wasn't a huge kid person. I wasn't. And, you, <laughs> and I've seen you go above and beyond what is just required of your duties as far as the program yeah. goes. So that's, I had a, that's I had a kid, I had, I had two, that, two you know, kids um, one time that I, I was their guardian for about a year and a half and their dream was to go see the heat. That's what all they wanted. That's what they had like always wanted since they were like they could remember. And I'm like, that's your dream to see the heat. Something that we don't even think about that we take yeah. for granted. Yeah. You know, and I had my you know a friend of mine who works for the heat. Yeah. Not only give them tickets, but they give them a tour and uh, they took them around the well, stadium and, and all that. And you know, it's like little stuff like that. You know, that to you maybe it's not a big deal, but is extremely significant to these children so yeah well guardian ad litem and regardless of where you're at i'm sure you can just google guardian ad litem program the name of your city and i'm sure it can direct you on a google search i'm gonna go ahead and give my last soda it's funny because i think i may have given it to them before to the heifer corporation it is the heifer corporation no it's not um the calf corporation the The joey joey Joey. save the little kangaroos save the kangaroos you should save the kangaroos no it's um it's an organization and again i'm thinking but you know what it's the holidays um it's called the hero initiative and what they are is a charity that is set up to help provide insurance and and funds for comic book creators who may find themselves in a situation where they can't afford a surgery or and these are actually true life situations you know there's people who their house is burned down oh my gosh they had no insurance they had all their possessions are gone there's somebody who actually and i can't remember the 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 creator's name but you know he goes through periods depending on how much work he has where he becomes homeless and he's living out of his car and you know these are talented people and with the recent death of stan lee you know it, it kind of reminded me that for every stan lee that we have who's managed to make money off of not even his creations because ultimately those were owned and are still owned by marvel but kind of managed to to make a name for himself and become this pop culture figure there are so many other creators out there writers illustrators inkers you know colorists mm-hmm. letterers who don't have that recognition don't have that notoriety and so don't have that opportunity to turn that into some type of you know monetary compensation and they've given us all so many years and so many characters of just enjoyment and people who mean things in our lives and i think it's you know it's just right to kind of do by them for everything they've given us that for xyz reason they haven't been able to you know just financially be supported and i think this is an organization that was it's run by people in the community it mm-hmm. was set up by people in the comic book community and you know they do auctions all year long if you go on ebay they auction off original art but they also just take you know donations so if you go to heroinitiative.org you can make a donation and you know certain donation levels have like a little gift and things like right. that but definitely something to keep in mind as as you're huddling around you know your your homes with your families and enjoying the holidays that there might be some people out there who may have lost some you know may have lost everything despite working very right, hard working their ass off yeah 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 well there we go guardian at litem and the hero the hero initiative well as always we hope you listen laughed and learned yeah and we're back to we're back to the norm because last week i i ended the show on a little bit of a different yes, line it was, holiday. it was a holiday so no lechon bueno what? lechon always lechon life i but don't have any lechon lechon life i like that shirt Hashtag Le Chong Life. We're, we're copywriting it. It's <laughs> it's ours. It's, it's ours. ours. It's episode 43. Episode Le Chong Life t-shirt coming. November 30th, 2018. <laughs> He's a lawyer. <laughs> so we hope you grab your patelito, your, your patelito, your croqueta, your jupina. And thank you so much for joining us as always. Bye, caballero. <laughs>